Hi everyone, thanks for coming. I'm Dimitri, software engineer at Red Hat and Postgres contributor. And today, we, today we're going to try to predict the future. To be more precise, given particular configuration and workload, we would like to estimate how Postgres is going to behave under this workload, like literally sort of imaginary. Uh, and here's our agenda for today. First of all, we'll try to establish the importance fact. Why is it even important to do this? And after that, we're going to try to uh, take different approaches at this problem. How could we uh, estimate Postgres behavior? So we're going to try something simpler, like a back of the envelope calculation. Uh, then we're going to do some more advanced stuff, like an approximation of various things. And then at the end, we're going to uh, try to simulate things. And to be more precise, we're going to try to estimate, like for example, how much disk space we're going to use, how much bloat is going to be generated, um, what kind of I.O., how much I.O. we're going to produce, and at the end, we are going to even give it a shot at latencies. So, here we are. First of all, we need to establish why should we even bother about this. That's the question I hear quite frequently. Uh, because, well, obviously, if you would like to understand something about Postgres, the first thing you could do is you could just benchmark it, right? Uh, that's right, absolutely. But there are a couple of problems with this approach. Because, first of all, a real proper benchmark could be quite resource intensive. It could be sometimes even prohibitively resource expensive uh, to run something. So, yeah, you have to think about this twice. Another problem is that it's hard sometimes to get a full coverage for your benchmarking. Sometimes you even have to benchmark something that does not exist yet. So imagine, for example, a team of developers came to you asking about advantages of this or that schema, and you have to advise them what to do without actually having anything at your hands. And the third point is that every benchmark <coughs> And benchmarking is by itself not perfect, not a silver bullet. And usually you have to verify benchmarks, you have to cross-validate them. And people are usually doing this with metrics, with some uh, trace points, whatever. But at the same time, uh, understanding what you expect to see from benchmark is already a good tool for cross-validation. So at the end, I would say we should not replace this prediction uh, with benchmarking. We have to actually enhance our benchmarking with prediction, with understanding what do we expect from the Postgres in the first place. So, another thing that I hear quite frequently when I'm talking about this topic is that people are saying, well, come on, it's easy, right? Uh, everything you have to do is just like bump a little bit of uh, Maxwell size or something like that, so that everything's going to fit in there. Or you have to probably, if it's not helping, you have to erase shared buffers, obviously. Or if even this doesn't help, then you probably have to configure vacuum somehow a little bit better. Uh, to clarify, all those advisors are quite good advisors in certain context, and um, the problem is that it's not so easy. And I've got a very good uh, analogy for you. Imagine that we have decided to drop our profession as software engineers, and we decided to go into civil engineering. And we were asked to build a bridge. So, if you're going to be asked about what are the properties of a bridge, right? Uh, there are obvious things. Yeah, okay. Beams, they have to be thick enough to sustain this weight. The connecting rods have to be, again, strong but flexible enough. Uh, but all of those questions, if you go a little bit more into the details, it's not so clear. So how thick those beams should be, right? How strong those rods should be? If you're going to just say, well, thick enough, people are going to laugh at you. Uh, the problem is we also have to think not about only how to build a bridge that it's not going to collapse right now, we also have to think about maintenance, right? So it's going to be like, for example, um, environment impact, all of this stuff. And as software engineers, we also have this pr frequently this problem that we also have to think across various layers. So in this context, for example, we have to think not only about the bridge as a physical entity, but also think about how, for example, it is going to affect uh, traffic in the city, right? So because it could be the case that we wanted to build a bridge to improve the traffic situation, and at the same time, we created an effect of induced traffic, and everything became worse. Uh, from one point of view, we built a good bridge, but at the same time, everything became worse. It's not what we wanted to achieve. And in software engineering and databases in particular, it's the same. So at the end of the day, things are complicated, even if they look like they're easy. So now we are understanding that it's important to actually understand how Postgres is going to behave, at least to get vague understanding about this. So we're going to experiment with something particular. <laughs> I'm going to show you this. This is going to be our target experiment for today. Extremely simple, even more than that. We're not even going to talk about table. We're not going to talk about anything. We're only going to try to understand how our index on this simple column is going to behave. And you see the use case is extremely like, limited, right? 
But throughout the slides, you will see that there are still quite a lot of things to talk about, even in this simple case. <coughs> so now let's go back of the envelope calculation. I'm pretty, pretty sure that everybody understands here more or less what does it mean. Essentially, we try to identify for every experiment, we try to identify the major contributing factors and then their level of magnitude. So this is something what we'll try to do here. First, we'll try to understand, uh, given particular schema that I've shown before, uh, what is the disk space or what is the space in general that is going to be consumed by this index we are talking about, right? And uh, the reason why I'm starting here is because the, the space consumption is some sort of a cornerstone, be a cornerstone behind every database because it produces quite a lot of other metrics. For example, depending on the disk space, you're going to, for example, derive an amount of I.O. you're producing, some other stuff. It's really important to understand. Uh, and unfortunately, already at this point, we have to limit even further things because there is a fill factor in Postgres that usually is set to 90, uh, which means that we have some amount of free space on the pages. By default, it's a very good idea, but for the purposes of this uh, talk, for the educational purposes, we're just going to use the whole page so that we do not have to think about this. All said done. Now, uh, if you recall, an index in Postgres, a B3 index, is a tree, right? Quite simple. There are uh, intermediate nodes, there are leaf nodes. Uh, and there's a very interesting uh, work called Modern B3 Techniques. Uh, I'm not stopping to talk about this one. It says that 99% uh, of the whole space usage for your index is actually contained within those leaves, which means that for our back of the envelope approximation, it's going to be fine if we just understand how much space are we spending storing those leaves. Now, it's enough if we're going just to say that if we're going to take a look at just one particular page. So let's take a look at this. And before uh, the question, how many items could we put into one index page, into one, uh, one of those leaf page? Uh, in fact, I've got actually a very interesting thing. I have developed an extremely sophisticated algorithm to answer various Postgres questions. Uh, throughout the talk, we're going to try to use it. And let's see what it's going to tell. So algorithm, please tell us how many of the elements could we put on the single index page? Yep. How many elements could we put on the index page? Oh, sorry, I have nothing to do with that, no. So, <coughs> let's try to investigate for ourselves. So, imagine this is a scheme. Uh, this is a single page that we've got on our index. It's 8 kilobyte by default, so let's see what does it contain. First, it contains some static parts, like header, index-specific parts. Uh, they're not really large, but we cannot do anything about them. They cont contain some amount of space. The first part that is really dynamic is the set of the item pointers. It's a very clever way of managing the space on the index page. And yeah, uh, spoiler alert, uh, we could fit 407 items of those very simple schemas, those integers, into a single index page. So the first dynamic part consists of those item pointers. Every single of them is four bytes, and they're like piling up together. Now the second part is the actual data. This time, every single part, every single item contains 16 bytes. And it's a very interesting question why. We could even try to investigate it a little bit. Give me a second. We could go there. PG, column size. So from here, we could see that the data we have, like the pure data, the integers, they have they, can only, they, they take only four bytes. So now the question is, why do we see on the diagram that they are actually containing 16 bytes, quite a lot, quite a lot more? Uh, the answer here is quite simple. Every single record on the index page has to contain a header, uh, plus it's a header, it's an eight byte, and then at the end of the day, it's 12 bytes, and Postgres has to max align it to 16 bytes. That's why I've got this amount of space. And interestingly enough, you can see on the diagram that we've got even those gaps in between. So there's like this max aligned part. Another pop quiz here is that you can see that on the top left corner, we've got eight kilobytes and the disk space we're consuming so far. We're still not there yet. We're still 12 bytes off. So any guess where those 12 bytes are coming from? Any wild guess, aliens, whatever. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to torture you anymore. It's this gap in the, mi in the middle, in between of our dynamic parts because they're growing towards each other. And interestingly enough, when they are meeting, we have 12 bytes left and it's just not enough, to, not, not enough place to fit any single uh, item anymore. We could even see this here with some page, uh, header, this one. So this is the, no, wait a moment, we actually have to insert. So uh, by the way, we've got this table. This is our table, we have to insert something. Insert, and if we're going to do this again, 
we see this is the offset of the first part, and this is the second, and this is exactly 12 bytes in between. Okay, now we understand uh, how much information we could put into our index. But unfortunately, it's only very static information. This, you will see something like this only if you're going to insert sequentially data one after another and not going to do anything else. Obviously, in real life, it looks quite much differently. One particular problem we're facing is bloat. And in fact, bloat is very hard to estimate in the sense that it's hard to even wrap your head around. How could you even like, estimate, do a back of the envelope and uh, calculation for a bloat, right? So to remind you, bloat, when we're talking about bloat, it's usually dead tuples, it, particularly in our indexes, and it's very nasty. Uh, it happens when you remove something, update something, or roll back and insert in transactions. So in theory, you could say that every of such transactions, the, the, every single such transaction had to insert a dead tuple, which means that we're increasing the bloat, right? So the, qu the next question we're going to face is how could we approximate this? The theory is just going to grow, right? So let's try to experiment that with that. Here's the workload against our table I was applying before. Essentially, enough in particular, we're just shuffling the data around without inserting anything new. In theory, this should produce a lot of dead tuples, right? So let's take a look how is it going to look like on the graphs. And the picture is absolutely mind-blowing. So let's take a look at this. I'm going to explain what's going to happen here. On the x-axis, we've got just simply time and the seconds. On the y-axis, we've got a dead amount of dead tuples on a single page, on a single bit tree page that I just randomly uh, took in the index. And interestingly enough, instead of complete constantly growing under this workload, we see that the amount of dead tuples is growing, 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 then suddenly it goes down and growing again and goes down. So we've seen, in, we've seen this oscillating pattern. Any idea was it happening like this? So it's a very interesting question. Let's ask our algorithm. Maybe, maybe the algorithm knows. Mm, damn. No, we actually would like to really understand what's going on. So. The answer is very interesting. The answer has something to do with the page splits. So the point is that Postgres is actually quite, uh, quite mm, good at optimizing things. So I'm going to show you. I've got a demo for this part as well. Imagine that we've got some table again. We've got our table test. And imagine we have deleted something. We've got deleted a couple of amount of elements. So let's verify how many dead tuples do we have so far. Uh, page. So you can see that so far, although we have deleted something, we still see that the amount of the tuples is zero. It means that there's a very interesting situation here. There's an inspection effect, some sort of. Postgres, to be able to understand that there are dead tuples, it first has to read this index. So now, let's say, explain, analyze. Let's read something. So we really did an index scan. We hit the page. And let's now to verify the previous one. Yeah, now it shows that we've got one, we have discovered one single tuple. So this is so far what happens here, right? And we've got a very interesting thing. So if we'll take a look at the index, we see that we've got only one leaf page so far, because I was saying 407 items is a one single page. Now let's try to insert something. In theory, we should trigger a page split, because it's just too many items on the one page, it has to be two of them. So insert into one more value. Let's verify. Well, suddenly it's still one page. No, nothing has happened. And let's take a look at that items. Dum, bum, bum. There is no more uh, at that tuple. So what has happened? Postgres is very good at trying to keep things optimizing and delaying, pages, uh, delaying a page split as much as possible. The reason is that page splits are uh, overhead. Uh, that's why it makes sense to delay them as much as possible. And one thing that Postgres tries to do is to tries to clean up the pages before we're actually reaching this point. And this is exactly what we see on the slide. We're accumulating this dead tuple, this bloat, and so on and so forth. And but then as soon as we have to split the page, Postgres verify, oh, come on, we've got a lot of dead tuples. Let's just get rid of them. And this is exactly what happens. Interestingly enough, uh, the workload was quite moderate in the sense, like 500 queries per second or something. So even uh, in this case, I have even disabled talk to vacuum. Nothing was happening. Just this particular fact of clean up dead tuples was enough for Postgres to keep up without any single page split, which is quite an interesting situation. and a very good information for us for the uh, index maintenance. But now it's a single page, right? So we're going back and forth, back and forth. 
Uh, my expectations were that on the level of the whole index, it's going to be different. It's going to be essentially just uh, like a noise, right? White noise, because all of those pages are just not going to be synchronized and we will just see some amount of bloat. But it's not the case. That is another mind-blowing thing. We see the very same oscillation happening here. And again, x axis time, y axis amount of dead tuples overall throughout the index. And we see those, those oscillations coming back and forth, back and forth. They are converging to some particular value, about one-fifth of the older tuples that were inserting, but nevertheless, it's a very interesting picture. And one-fifth or one-fourth, depending on the context, is the estimation for the bloat we could put under these particular constraints. Now, one caveat that I have to mention, of course, is that we've got this inspection effect. So it's very important to understand how many tuples do you read in this workload? So for the experiment, I was producing a side effect. I was producing a read uh, workload that was just making sure that we've got all those dead tuples verified. If you're not doing this, your results are going to look different. OK. Now, having said that, uh, let's try to do something more advanced. Let's try to approximate things. Uh, and it's very interesting what we're going to do. Let's try to figure out how many I.O. are we going to generate under the same, part, some particular workload with this simple index. Um, there's a lot of things in the background. So first of all, we have to clarify that we have to slim down our use case even more, unfortunately. I'm going to explain why is it happening like this, but for now we just need to uh, say that we're not bothering with, for example, write ahead log. We don't really, we're not interested in this. We're just interested in this particular index. Uh, having said that, there are more things we have to disable just to concentrate ourselves on this particular small, tiny bit of Postgres. We have to turn off the vacuum, all these flush after things, background writer, checkpointers, whatever, because we don't, for, this, for the purposes of this part, we're not interested in those things. Uh, now, I'm going to show you a couple of things just to demonstrate the results. So I was experimenting what I have done. I have built a model that predicts for you the I.O. Uh, produced under some various workloads. It's like a simple Python script uh, that uh, calculates some data based on the configuration. And uh, I'm going to show a couple of graphs uh, based a couple of results for this model. So the first one I was experimenting with was a simple read-only workload. So when we're talking about this case, the I.O. that has been generated from this is just because there is not enough uh, memory or shared buffers to fit this index into this memory. So this is the only source of I.O. that we've got. <laughs> and here's a graph where we could compare the model, the output of the model that I was proposing, with the results of real benchmarks. So the orange line shows you the real test, the real benchmark, and the blue line shows you the model. You see, they're going, they're going quite hands in hand. That's quite nice here. And what happens here is that on the y-axis, we actually vary amount of shared buffers for Postgres, so amount of memory that Postgres could use to perform some various operations, where on the y-axis we've got uh, read I.O. operations produced under these conditions. And you can see, as I said before, the difference is quite small. And similar thing is happening when we try to experiment with inserts, with an insert workload. Again, a simple stuff, we're just inserting something into a sim an, an empty table, and Again, the results are also quite interesting. So we've got our model, results produced by our model in a blue, and the benchmark, the real test, uh, is shown in an orange. Uh, it's actually a little bit more interesting behind here, but I'm going to explain it in a couple of words. On y-axis this time, we're actually modifying write ahead log delay, so uh, wall writer delay. Because it turns out that although we are not using uh, like uh, write ahead log for the table, we're not using anything, we still have to commit transactions because we're inserting something. And this commit, this fact that transaction is getting committed, is still ha it has to land in the write ahead log. There is no way around this. So we have to take this into account, and this is what happens here. So the summary. The results looks quite, they look quite interesting because we have created some artificial model that, produce some, that produces some results for us, and they look even quite close to the reality. So what does it mean for the background? So how the model looks like, right? Unfortunately, I have to show this picture. And in fact, it may look quite intimidating, but it's not so scary at the end. So let me explain what happens here. This is essentially an idealistic representation of the workload that I was experimenting with, where we've got essentially the first part, how much I.O. could we generate, just due to the reading of the things, where we don't have enough memory to put our index pages um, and to work with them. The second part is about inserting. So this is the essentially this part represents 
how frequently we do write ahead uh, log flush because we just have committed a transaction. And then every now and then there is a split happening and there is the third part. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So those are three sources we're taking into account when we are talking about this model. Now, obviously, it's very, very limited. So we're not talking about SLRU, we're not talking about, I don't know, free space maps, nothing like that. We literally just excluded it, even uh, uh, dirty, write or dirty pages. We're not talking about writing dirty pages because we have postponed all this stuff as much as possible. And yet, in this tiny part of Postgres, this is how we could approximate this. It's extremely complicated and a very unfortunate thing. <coughs> you might rightfully ask, What's the point here? How could we use it? Because first of all, I have to mention you, the I.O. I'm talking about, they're not even real I.O. that are going to land on your disk. Those are the I.O. that Postgres tries to request via syscalls, which means that those I.O. still have to go in through the file system cache, which means that probably they're going to you know, be merged together and sometimes satisfied from the memory. So you're going to ask, what's the point? Like, how could we apply this knowledge, this very limited knowledge, to the reality? And I've got a very interesting answer for you. The point is that the model, although how simple it is, it's composable, combinable model. And what could happen uh, is, and it's what, what's happening, is that people are creating those small models and piling them together to understand what's going on on the overall picture. So you could easily create a model for an index, how is it behaving, you could create a model for a write ahead log, how much yo is it going to produce for some other stuff, and so on and so forth. And then even for the, for example, yeah, Linux page cache, there is a research, there is a dissertation, some people were trying to model how much yo is going to be happening just because of the file system cache. You combine those models, you put them one onto another, and then you've got some approximation of the reality. Um, yep. Now, <laughs> a very interesting part about simulation, the matrix and everything. So you may have noticed that so far I was talking about very robust metrics. So like uh, space used, um, I.O. produced, and the amount of dead tuples. All of those metrics are very robust in the sense that they do not really usually depend on the load, for example so that if your database is overloaded, you're still most of the time going to take the same amount of space on the disk, right? The latency, though, is very much more complicated in this context. The latency uh, is quite volatile, and latency's uh, profile, depending on the workload on your database, could be extremely different. It's hard to work with latencies. I haven't even tried to model them in this way. It's just extremely impossible. But there is a very interesting tool we could try to use to still get some understanding to learn, learn something about latencies and its simulation. So uh, let's think about this. What still could we do about trying to understand the latencies? So that we're firing some queries against the database and we get some latencies. What's going to happen? How could we understand something about them? And the idea is very interesting. So what we could do is we could create just a state machine that represents the major parts uh, through which uh, every single query is going on the database side. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, the experiment I was uh, working with was just this update workload I was showing before. And every single query was going through the following stages. So we, first of all, we had to read something from the network. Then we had to fetch the cached plan because the transactions were prepared. Then we, were have to, we had to work with an index, with a heap. At the end, we had to commit the transaction. And then we had to respond something over the network. So those were the major stages that every single query was going through for this particular workload. And what we could do, it's like, it's like almost fascinating. You could create a state machine that represents those states. And then you can pile them together like hundreds, thousands, doesn't really matter, depending on what you would like to do, and then see how are they going to perform together in conjunction. Because the point is that every single of those stages, it's going to be described by some random variable. Uh, don't be afraid, just think about this, that it's something that is non-deterministic, but still looks like the original value. Because obviously, for example, if you're going to read something from the network, you never get the same value over and over, right? You'll get like 10 microseconds, 20 microseconds. It's going to be varying, and this is what we're trying to represent here. So every single stage has some amount of variability behind, but the overall pattern looks quite similar to what we've got in the reality. Now, all of this sounds very abstract, I know, I know. And in fact, I was somehow myself not really expecting to learn anything from such a simple model. But what has happened is was a completely a different picture. So I was trying to create such a script that will produce a simulation that is similar to the original example, when we were just doing an update workload. And I've learned something new. 
So what was happening is that uh, I've learned, first of all, that one, the most contributing thing to the latencies, or rather to the variance of the latency, is not a working with an I.O., not working with an IO transactions or something, but rather working with the networking. At least in this particular context, PQ get byte was the function that has much more volatile profile than anybody else, than any other functions there. Usually they were finishing within like what, 40, 50 microseconds, something like that. PQ get byte, 90% of those calls were finishing within 10 microseconds. It was the fastest function ever, like blazingly fast. Yet, about 10% of those uh, calls were finishing within 100 microseconds, within 200 microseconds, and there's a handful of those calls that were finishing within 5 milliseconds. So in comparison with the overall 500 microseconds of the overall transactions, on average, it's like a huge, it's a, a huge difference. Um, and interestingly enough, all the rest of the phases, they are quite moderate in the sense, they're quite stable. They are just finishing within their 60 or 40 microseconds, and they do not vary that much. So that's what we have learned. That's already good to know. But there is a very interesting consequence of this learning. So what I'm showing you on the graph is that we've got two uh, lines. So first of all, it's um, a latency distribution for this function I was talking about. We've got on the y-axis latency in microseconds, and then on the, on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, we've got frequency, how frequently this particular function was finished within this amount of latency. And we've got two modes here. So you see the red one, where we're finishing extremely fast, and then there is a second bump, which is a quite small one. It's a very moderate one, but when we're going to summarize them, it, it contributes about 10% of the overall results. And you see this one is much, much slower. It's about like 170 microseconds on average. So the distribution is two model. In a simple word, most of the time your function is going to be extremely fast, but about 10% of the time it's going to be much slower. Uh, what happens here is that although we know this, we could, we could see a very interesting uh, consequence of this bump on the overall latencies. If you run PG benchmark against your database, you see that overall, like, well, it shows you that on average, uh, every single query shows you about 500 microseconds. That's okay, uh, but when, you tried, when I was trying to simulate following this approach, with a PQ get byte, a very stable one, without all these long tails, so very stable PQ get byte, I was getting only 300 microseconds. So much, much far away from the reality, right? And I was curious, why is it happening like this? Uh, the difference, like 200 microseconds, is quite a lot in this case. And then I've put into the, my, uh, into the simulation only this small bump. Again, 10%, 170 microseconds. It sounds almost nothing. And then suddenly I've got almost the real results. It was 450. 50 microseconds, so it's almost the real benchmark that I was performing. And it turns out that in Postgres, or in general in such complicated systems as databases, there is this avalanche effect. Um, the point is that when we're reading from the network, it happens at the very beginning, uh, which means that every single, um, every single delay, let's say it this way, is going to accumulate over time. It's going to affect the following stages, which means that there is an amplification effect, and where even those smaller things are going to produce quite a significant effect on the average latencies. So that was a very interesting learning, and the difference, just to remind you, for uh, 300 microseconds, and we've got an out of it about 150 microseconds, so twice, although original bump was 10%. Okay, now we are more or less finished, and a couple of takeaways for you folks. So, um, first of all, I would like you to know that prediction of the future is definitely possible in the sense that you can try to understand how Postgres is going to behave under this or that workload. It's not impossible, although it's hard. And the second part is that you need to be aware about limitations. So you've seen, although the case I was showing at the very beginning is very simple, right? A simple index on a simple column. Unfortunately, we still had to remove and limit this even by itself, a limited model, even further. So it really just isolated a small part of the overall Postgres machinery to understand how it works. That's it. We just were interested in this particular part. And the reason for that is that it's just overwhelming to try to understand everything. Postgres is very complicated. There are a lot of moving parts, and it's hard just to understand all of them together. Uh, 
Yeah, so um, it's, it could be overwhelming. I did not even try to model everything at once. That's why it's important to pick up only one particular part, only small thing, and then you can take a look at this, at this small bit, and try to uh, play with this thing around. And then the, the fourth thing I want for you to remember is that it's actually important to not to not uh, limit yourself to only this particular tool. So I was talking throughout this talk about what? I was talking about benchmarking, I was talking about profiling, and I was talking about trying to predict the future, right? And it's important that you're going to combine those tools together. If you're using all of them three together, the point is that you can understand almost everything what's going on inside. It's not a black box for you for your database anymore. And in fact, probably there could be some questions about this, but I can mention about this right now. The profiling plays a significant role here. Um, <coughs> because every time when I, for example, talking, okay, there's a a state machine with those, with those and those stages, right? It's not that I've come somehow learned about this from the blue sky or something. I was profiling Postgres to see what's happening inside. So this information as an input is very important from this point of view. The same with I.O. estimation. It's not like I was able, for example, to estimate how much I.O. was produced under this or that workload. I was able to literally create a trace point to measure those things. And this is exactly what's important to be doing when you're experimenting with this stuff. You it's important to get the real data, it's important to experiment, but it's also important to get an understanding what do you expect in the first place. So I think that's pretty much it. So hopefully it was not so overwhelming for you and you've got some amount of questions for me. Mm -hmm.